Well, welcome everyone this evening to the beautiful Robert McLaughlin Art Gallery. I know a number of you were uh, with us today uh, as we began our conference. Uh, tre or rather, our, our conference here at UIT on technologies of justice. And today uh, we have our keynote panel exploring the question of treaties as technologies of justice. And I would like to ask uh, our traditional knowledge keeper at the UOIT, uh, Rick Bork, to offer a few words of welcome to start us off. Ani, bonjour. Hello and welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone to Mississauga First Nation Territory of the first people of Scugog Island. Um, I'm, I couldn't do a smudge today, so I've got my eagle feather here. Um, it's protocol for me to introduce myself with my spirit name. My spirit name is Medicine Gord. I'm a bear clan. Um, my ancestors are Mi'kmaq, Lakota, and French on one side, Maliseet, Scottish and English on the other side. Um, it's also protocol to share a bit where I get my teachings. I've done ceremonies since 2002 uh, where we fast for four days, nothing to eat or drink, dancing in the sun. It's where I've learned a lot of my traditions, a lot of my culture. Uh, I'm, uh, I've helped out at Sacred Fires, uh, I'm a sweat lodge conductor. My bundle, I'm a bundle carrier, pipe carrier, and it's protocol for me to explain this uh, when I come up and do this sort of stuff. Also, it gives me a little bit more time to talk about stuff. Um, I can't do my smudge, but uh, when we smudge with our four medicines, it's to to help everything conduct in a good way. Uh, we did that this morning at, uh, at 9.30, so that energy I brought here, or we all brought it here, right? Uh, I'm gonna start with our prayer. Uh, Creator, Great Spirit, Miigwech. Miigwech from Mother Earth and all that she provides for all her relations. Creator, Zai Medicine Gourd, hear my prayers. Watch over the young babies, young girls and boys, and our elderly, that they not go cold, hungry, or hurt, and whoever's hurting them, stop and find help in a good way. Creator, wake up humanity and the people in the power to look after our four elements so our next generation's got fresh, clean water and fresh air to breathe. I want to say Ji Miigwech for the last seven generations that kept these ceremonies going, and the small part we're playing today to keep these ceremonies going for the next seven generations. I say atakias and all my relations. Miigwech. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce the Debuewin sisters. Uh, Jill Thompson and her sister, Jamie Kozlinski, are from the Mississauga of Skog Island First Nation. And uh, Jill, we are so fortunate to have as the Indigenous Culture Advisor at UOIT. And uh, just since her tenure at this institution, I think we have um, made some real progress and in, in developing relationships, in supporting our students, and finding a new direction for the university to take. So I'd like to take that opportunity to thank Jill for being such a wonderful colleague, and I'd like to invite them to welcome us with their singing and driving. Uh, Tom, for those kind words. Um, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I want to thank Tom for inviting us. Um, so yes, we are both from the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation. Um, oh, I forgot. Onin Bojol, Jill and Dijinka, Skugog Minasing Dunjwa. So that's how I introduced myself. I just said hello and welcome. My name is Jill Thompson. I'm from the Mississaugas of Skugog Island First Nation. And um, we're just going to do two songs for you tonight. and. Uh, the first one is called Endayan, and which means our homeland. So we thought it was appropriate. It's an honor song um, to honor the lands that that we're sitting on today. Miigwech. <clears throat>
<laughs> I got so into it, I, I didn't want to stop. <laughs> I was supposed to stop when my sister stopped. Miigwech. <clears throat> um, Whew, it's warm in here. <laughs> um, so the next song we're going to do is called The Traveling Song. And we just want to thank everybody for traveling to get here. And we want to wish everybody safe travels home. So. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to invite up uh, the mayor of this fine town, uh, John Henry, who'd like to extend a word of welcome. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. But first of all, how about giving the organizers a big round of applause? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm really lucky that I can bring, bring greetings on behalf of the city of Oshawa, but you know that Oshawa comes from a Ojibwa word called the crossing place. And I'm excited to say that in my office, I have one of the finest pieces of Aboriginal art that you can see that hangs on the wall and reminds me of what our First Nations people have done for our community since the beginning of time. And I want to welcome you to one of the finest, best kept secrets in all of Ontario is this gallery. And, and what you might not know is that our staff here is incredible for the work they do, but we own the largest collection of Painters 11 in the world as a municipality. And then when you came in this evening, there's a beautiful piece of black sculpture on the front lawn at City Hall. Only two of those are, are in the world. It's owned by the Meadmore Foundation out in New York City, and the other piece is in New York City. And we were lucky when they chose Oshawa as a place to be. And when you talk about this gallery and you talk about Robert McLaughlin Gallery, you have to talk about R.S. McLaughlin. Now, R.S. McLaughlin was a young man, an entrepreneur that worked in his father's business that burned to the ground in 1899. And the city of Oshawa at that time lent that family $50,000. That's 1899. And with that money, they built the McLaughlin Carriage Company, rebuilt it. Then they built the McLaughlin Buick Company. And then they went on to create one of the most amazing companies in the history of this country called General Motors of Canada. And that was R.S. McLaughlin. His legacy can be seen around this building, not only in this garden, but in our library, in high schools. His wife's name is on public schools. That Oshawa is a city of leaders and, and people who have great, played a great role in the development of this country, similar to UOIT, where we have great leaders that are empowering the minds of young people, and they're leaving school to go out and change the world. And I'm incredibly proud to be the mayor of a city where we have 21,000 young people going to school full time. That education is the second largest employer in our area with over 6,000 people. And take a, a, a city like Oshawa who has had an impact in this country since the beginning of time through people like R.S. McLaughlin or around the university, E.P. Taylor, who invented the toaster. Most people know him for a racehorse named Northern Dancer that this city has been a big part of building this country. So to all of you in the room, to all the educators, thank you for what you do. Thank you for making great young people our future leaders and helping to make Oshawa one of the greatest places in Canada to live. Have a good evening. The next person I would like to ask to come up to say a few words is our interim president and vice chancellor, 
Robert Bailey, who's been a tremendous support for this event. I, I actually saw him attending panels earlier in the afternoon, sitting in the back taking notes. So it's great to have a academic leader like that here at this institution. I'd like to invite up Bob. Thanks very much, Tom. And I'll just pull out my notes here <laughs> that I made. Thanks, thanks so much, John. Uh, great to have you here. Great to be welcomed by, by this wonderful city. Thanks, where's Rick? He's probably on to his next job, but thanks so much, Rick. I, it's not an event. It doesn't really feel like an event, a UOIT event, unless Rick has helped us start it. I'm sorry we couldn't have the smudge, but great to have your words and, you, and your welcome and your wisdom. So thank you. And Jill and Jamie, <laughs> let's hear it again for... <laughs> And a uh, word of advice, um, I, I've been a musician in my checkered past, so when you do something like, you know, the extra couple of jumps, just make it seem like it was all planned. <laughs> um, so thanks again, as John was saying, to Tom McMorrow and his team for organizing such a great event. As Tom said, I've been able to go to a couple of the sessions. Um, and, and I, you know, in those sessions, I've seen things from, we talked about at a, sort of a pre-session, indigenous perspectives on climate change. Um, today, I saw a talk about certainty and uncertainty, uh, understanding and ignorance in the context of DNA evidence, really cool stuff. And I was thinking about the title, because when Tom first told me about the conference, Technologies and Justice, it didn't really make sense to me. I'm a, I'm a like positivist scientist, environmental scientist, and I, so I had to sort of think it through and look at the program. And my take on it was, um, and forgive me if this sounds too naive or uh, juvenile, but so you, we're trying to increase information to increase understanding, and that's sort of a pathway to evidence, I think, um, which can be helped by technology. Uh, and, and maybe uh, everybody these days talks about evidence-based decision-making and um, you know where it is or where they think it is and, and where it's not either happening or, or perceived as part of reality, I guess. Um, so the creation of this evidence or the assembly of this evidence sort of leads to justice, maybe. That's the flow. Um, the caricature maybe of that is evidence-based decision-making leads to a declaration to do this. You know, we have the evidence, so we must do this, where from the point of view of a scientist like myself, I've always thought of it as like my role is if you do this, my best guess is that I, that one, that's that with the number one, that one is more likely to happen than that two. And then I say to society, um, do you want that one or that two? So I don't, I don't feel like it's my role to say you want that one. <laughs> rather than assembling evidence and then suggesting to society what my best guess is as to what will happen. But it, in being at the conference and thinking about it, trying to think about it more deeply, I thought about, well, okay, that all sounds wonderful, but who gets to provide evidence? Um, who judges the evidence's veracity? And I get to because, as I said, I'm an environmental scientist, I've got gray hair, I'm male, I'm entitled, I'm in a position of power, um, I'm a quantitative ecologist, so when I present evidence, as long as I keep my behavior within the, the socio-cultural norms of environmental science, um, my evidence is given high regard. 
And what I've thought about, what I've been forced to think about the last couple of days, and I've thought about it a bit before the last couple of days, is what about citizen science? What about indigenous knowledge? What about uh, two-eyed scene, as my friends Albert Merdina Marshall and Cheryl Bartlett have, have done so much great work on in Udamagi? Uh, what about qualitative methods of looking at environmental effects of uh, things that, that cause climate change or cause widespread uh, biodiversity reduction. So those are the kind of things that at least I've been provoked to think about over the last couple of days. And thank you so much for Tom for hosting this session and for all of you who come from afar and those of you who are here to get together for these great, great discussions. It's been wonderful to be a little bit of a part of it. And I guess on behalf of UOIT, just to finish up, I welcome you here. Thank you for coming here and sharing your wisdom and your discussion with us. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, I would like to now introduce you to the president of the Canadian Law and Society Association. The Canadian Law and Society Association, of which a number of you are members and a number of people are just members in waiting, um, is, a, is a scholarly association that really does foster this kind of interdisciplinary inquiry and engagement and multiplicity of methods of thinking uh, and critiquing and acting in the world. And so uh, I'd like to invite uh, our, our esteemed president, uh, Lindsay Campbell. Thank you. Esteemed, huh? <laughs> wow. Um, thank you, Tom. And thank you, Sarah, who's been doing, all, they've been, thank you for this wonderful place you've got for us. Thank you, Rick, thank you, Jamie and uh, Jill. It, what a great environment this is. I was sitting watching and listening and reflecting on this, the space we have around us and how much it kind of invites us to think outside of text or to think about text in a new way and, and meaning in a new way and interpretation in a new way. And I also found myself reflecting on the history of the toaster, which I hadn't ever done before. Um, and I, I reflect on history a lot, but I, the toaster had entirely eluded me. So um, I, it's been a great day. Tom, this is a roaring success. Thank you for doing all this work. When Tom initially said he wanted to have a conference here at, <laughs> at UOIT, we, we thought, well, that's awesome. People don't usually leap forward and say, hey, I want to host a conference and I want it to be a big, important and exciting conference. Hey, go, Tom, go. And so <laughs> he's done a great job. And I know Tom and his colleagues here have all been very enthusiastic. And we are very, very grateful to you and for hosting our board meeting. I was looking at Lindsay there trying to encourage her to continue. Um, no, but it's a great opportunity to, to be able to uh, acknowledge how um, my colleagues in, in legal studies, the Faculty of Social Science and Humanities, there's not too many of them, so I can list them all. Rachel Aris, Sasha Bagley, Andrea Slane, Natalie Oman, and Jen Rinaldi. Uh, it really has been uh, teamwork, um, and uh, so thank you so much. Not to mention uh, Lindsay's own support and, and the, the Canadian Law and Society Association. And also, uh, as Lindsay mentioned, Sarah Ventura, uh, who is a fourth year political science student. And as I have said to her and to others when I introduce her, an organizer extraordinaire. And, uh, and also our other wonderful student volunteers who are, who are a couple of them are here this evening and you'll meet more of them tomorrow. So I'd like to uh, introduce our keynote. We're gonna put these tables up and uh, we have a terrific panel for you. Uh, we have uh, Johnny Mack, who is a law professor from the University of British Columbia. He's from the New Channel First Nation. And uh, he's joining us today. He's flown in from Vancouver. Saw him last night. He said, boy, are my arms tired. Uh, we have uh, Michael Coyle, who is a law professor from Western University. And he's also a mediator who's been involved in the mediation of land claims in this province. We have Karen Drake, who is a law professor from Osgoode Hall. And she is a member, a citizen of the Métis 
nation of Ontario. And we also have Ann Taylor, who is a cultural archivist at Curve Lake First Nation. And some of you may have met her today when we viewed the uh, wonderful uh, documentary that, uh, one of the documentaries that Curve Lake has put out about the history of treaties in this area. And um, the panel will be moderated by my colleague Natalie Ullman, who's a professor of legal studies here at UOIT, um, who's own research, among other things, it, again, if you were at the uh, panel, the first panel this morning on free prior and informed consent, and she's doing work on the right to uh, physical and cultural survival, particularly of indigenous nations in Latin America. That's her, her latest work. So um, I, I'm going to invite everyone to uh, take a seat. And what we're going to do is have a uh, presentation from each of the speakers, and then we're going to open it up into a discussion, and, um, and you'll have an opportunity to, to ask uh, questions then. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'd like to invite, uh, first of all, Ann Taylor to start us off this evening. Um, much like, can you guys hear me? Um, I have a little bit of a laryngitis thing happening, so my voice goes in and out, so I, I apologize. I don't usually sound this lovely. <laughs> but um, like Rick, I'm compelled to, and, and uh, the sisters, I'm compelled to introduce myself our traditional way in our language. Um, so, bojo, ani, manga kwandishnikas, nigigen doda. So what I've said there, Bojo, I'm honoring my elder brother, Nana Bojo. I've said, I mean, our way of saying hello, but it also means I see that spirit light in each and every one of you. It's a much nicer way of saying hello than just hello or hi. Um, I gave you my spirit name, Manga Kwan. Um, which means loon feather. Uh, you can call me Anne or uh, Manga Kwan. Um, I gave you my uh, Dota, Nikik. That's the Otter Clan. Uh, and with that clan comes certain responsibilities uh, to myself, to my community, and to those other uh, members of my greater family, um, the Otter Clan in other communities. Um, I've told you where I'm from, Shikikamon. Uh, my community in English is called Curve Lake, um, but in the language of Shigamam, what you know when you know that language, that word tells you that um, the water's not too deep. Uh, there's food growing on that water, and if there's food, there's medicine. And uh, to us, a lot of times that food is medicine. Uh, black rice, for instance. Um, so you get a lot of information from our language that isn't present in Curve Lake. You would never know by the words Curve Lake that uh, our little tiny community uh, is so special in terms of land. Um, I told you that I'm a Michisagi Ganishinaabekwe. Michisagi, you have all heard as Mississauga. Uh, the words are actually Michisagi. So that places us on the land. It places us at the mouths of those rivers. Uh, it tells you that that's where our people um, camped. Uh, we had fishing camps along the river. We had uh, maple bush camps. We had uh, fishing years. We had all kinds of things on the land. So when we introduce ourselves that traditional way, we are giving presents to our ancestors, and we're giving presents to those ones that haven't been born yet. And so that's the important thing. That's why we do that. So you'll know a little bit about us. Uh, you'll know that those ones that haven't been born yet, that haven't been thought of yet, are very, very important to us. And this is why we do this work, um, is for those ones that haven't been born. Um, we are so honored that so many of us have had um, elders that have taught us who we are, taught us the importance of our, um, our nation and what we can accomplish. Um, treaties are, are a very complicated process. And it was not like that in the beginning. 
When we used wampum, it was very, very simple. Very simple. Two colors, purple and white. Those two colors tell us a lot. When the background is white, we know that that wampum was created in a time of peace. When that background of a wampum is in that dark color of purple, we know that there was trouble brewing um, and that we overcame that. Uh, each one of those beads had to be individually made. And the thing about those beads, when you make them from the Kohak shell, uh, they become toxic to the person who's creating them. So they must be made with water because uh, that, if it gets into your lungs, uh, it kills you. And it was usually the women who made those beads. So today we find ourselves uh, signing paper treaties uh, with the uh, crown, with the government, uh, completely different than the way we treated with each other, the way we agreed with each other. We dealt with each other on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. And in Canada, there are so many nations. Um, and we often get lumped under the same umbrella. But when you look at those nations, each one of us has our own language, our own laws, our own belief system, our own way of educating, our own way of viewing the land, and our own way of relating to the land. So you have to keep that in mind when you're looking at treaties. It's very, very important to know the nation whose territory you are living on. Um, so we were signatories to 18 different treaties. Um, many of you have heard of the Williams Treaty. Very important treaty. It was signed in 1923 and it finally made it to the court system. Finally. I did not think that we would see that in the court system in my lifetime. I'm 55 years old and I just never thought I'd ever see that the Williams Treaty would be in the courts and being dealt with in a good way. Um, I've had the privilege and the honor to read the interviews of the men because it was all men who were interviewed by the government for those treaties. Three weeks, they, gave the inter they interviewed everybody in three weeks for that massive piece of land. They weren't interested, the lawyers were not interested in hearing the stories of those men. All they wanted to know was, did you hunt here? Where did you trap? Where did you fish? They wanted to know all that. One of the fellows who was interviewed, a gentleman, was, um, he was 89 years old when he was interviewed. And when you read his interview, you can tell that he has a story. He has a story, but no one was willing to listen to that. And if you know anything about First Nations, we have stories for everything, because that's how we pass down information. We didn't have papers. We didn't write things down. Sometimes we carved in rocks, sometimes we painted on the sides of rocks. But we didn't carry that information with us. It was important for us to keep that oral tradition because that oral tradition forces us to remember, to remember those stories and to listen carefully and to understand what is being said. That's very, very important to First Nations people. We were never, um, a group of people that wrote things down. So when those lawyers came and started writing things down, and they weren't willing to listen to our stories, you're only getting half of the tale. You need those stories to understand the impact that the land has on us, the impact that we have on the land. Uh, those stories are necessary. Um, one of my dear friends and elder, uh, Doug Williams. Doug was a chief of my community and uh, he was arrested for uh, frogging out of season because according to the Williams Treaty, the only thing we could gather and hunt were bullfrogs. So he wanted to establish that right. So he and his friend Wayne, they went bullfrogging and I think they caught something like six bullfrogs and then the uh, the game wardens caught them, they were arrested, and uh, Doug and Wayne fought that case all through the court system in Canada. And uh, it wasn't until a couple of years ago 
that um, someone decided to take a second look at that case and, and actually realize that, yeah, we do have the right to hunt, to fish, to trap within a certain area. It is entrenched in Canadian law. But that Williams Treaty, that's exactly what the Williams Treaty tried to take away from us, were those rights. We have um, stories of our community members who had to sneak off the reserve to um, hunt, to fish, and to harvest food just so their families could live. They'd have to sneak back onto the reserve so their families could survive. Um, so those treaties, we have a long way to go in building that relationship. So when we're here, when we have such esteemed people here in this group who are looking at that as a means of justice, it says that we're, we're doing a good thing. Everybody throws around that big word, reconciliation. And I talked to a gentleman today about that, about how that's a very relative yeah. term. It's relative to each and every one of us. Um, it means something different to each and every one of us. But this, what we're doing, sitting here, listening to each other, respecting each other, honoring each other, and honoring those ancestors and the land that we sit on today, that's a good step in that direction. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have left. Um, two minutes? Okay. Well, I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing Johnny Cash. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> really. um, but I do want to say miigwech, kachim miigwech, for uh, Tom for organizing this and for all of you um, sitting here and taking part in this because I know in my heart that you'll be taking something away with you and you'll be taking away a better understanding of our relationship. Uh, so, Jimmy Wedge. Thank you so much, Anne, Jimmy Wedge. I'd like to ask Karen Drake now to share her thoughts with us as well. Great, thank you. Ani, bonjour, tanche, good evening. I want to thank the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation for welcoming us to their territory. I want to thank the organizers of this event for the invitation to be here. And I want to thank each of you for the opportunity to engage with you right now. So what I'd like to talk about is what I think is a popular misconception about the interpretation of the so-called historical land surrender treaties. So the popular conception is premised on a dichotomy between an indigenous perspective on the one hand, that the treaties are uh, an agreement to enter into a relationship to share the land, and that's contrasted with a uh, British campaign perspective that the treaties are about a surrender of sovereignty. And what I want to focus on is the interpretation from the British and Canadian perspective. And my contention is that the notion that from within the British campaign perspective, the treaties represent a surrender of sovereignty, that that itself is a myth. That from the British campaign perspective, that was never what the treaties were actually about even from that Western perspective. So to see this, let's start by thinking about the written text of the treaties. So according to the written text, it, the treaties say that uh, the signatories, the First Nation signatories, are agreeing to surrender, seed, release, all of their rights and titles whatsoever. Right? But there's no mention of sovereignty. The treaties do not say that the signatories are surrendering sovereignty. And I often get the response, well, yes, but the, the cause is so vague and so general that surely that could encompass sovereignty, right? All rights, title, interests whatsoever. And I would, I would contend that the answer is no. That when Britain wanted to affect the surrender of sovereignty, it knew exactly how to put that into the language that it wanted, right? So for instance, the Treaty of Paris of 1763 uh, the treaty that ends the Seven Years' War, where France is ceding its claim to sovereignty over what is now referred to as North America. The key passage there uses the specific word sovereignty, right? Britain doesn't uh, mince words. Similar, the same thing can be said about the Treaty of White of 1840, right? So on the English version, not the Maori version, but in the English version that Britain drafts, when it is seeking a, so a surrender of sovereignty from the Maori, it uses the exact specific word sovereignty. But we don't see that in any of the so-called historical land surrender treaties in Canada. 
Okay, so then what is the significance of these treaties then? What are they doing, at least from the British Canadian perspective? Well, to know that, we have to go back to an old case from 1883 called St. Catherine's Mill. And what was happening in this case was that there's this company, St. Catherine's Mill, it's a timber company, and they go out and they cut about 2 million feet of timber around Bobby Coon Lake, which is in northwestern Ontario. And they got the license to cut that timber from the Dominion government. And the Ontario government had a problem with this. They say, the Dominion government, you can't be issuing a license to them. This is our territory, it's in Ontario. Only we can issue that license. Now, like I said, this was happening around Bobby Goon Lake in Northwest Ontario. And my father and his brothers and all their cousins are members of Bobby Goon Lake Ojibwe Nation. And I've taught this case many times, St. Catherine's Milling. And it wasn't until I was researching to write this paper that this talk is based on, that I learned for the first time that this case is actually about my family's territory. Right? It's actually, it actually has to do with my family and my community. And I never knew that before. How could that be? How could I have read this decision over and over again so many times and never have known this? Well, the reason is because First Nations played no part in this case whatsoever. They were not parties. They were not interveners. They weren't even called as witnesses, even though this case establishes the foundation of Aboriginal title in Canadian law. First Nations had no part to play in establishing that foundation. Okay, so what happened here? It turns out that Ontario won, but in order to understand the significance of this, we have to know what the Dominion government was arguing. What they were arguing is that uh, Prior to the First Nations entering into Treaty 3, which is the treaty that covers that territory, what they had was essentially uh, a full right to land, what we call in property law a fee simple. And that the effect of Treaty 3 was just to transfer that over to the Dominion government. Right? And so because they transferred that right to the Dominion government, then the Dominion government had the right to the land, and that's why they were entitled to issue the license to the lumber company. Okay, it turns out that the Privy Council rejects this. They say, no, that was not what Treaty 3 was doing. That's not what was happening with the treaty. Instead, they said that actually, the title to the land always belonged to Ontario, even before the treaty was ever entered into. Ontario had the title to the land before the treaty and after the treaty. Instead, the interest that my ancestors had in that land was referred to as a mere burden on Ontario's title. And all the treaty did was erase that burden, right? It just extinguished that burden. So the Dominion government never got title to the land, so they never could give out that license. Okay, so then the question is, well, how did Ontario get that title? Where did they get that title from? It couldn't have come from the treaty, right? Because they had it before the treaty was ever entered into. Did it come from conquest? Did Ontario somehow conquer uh, my ancestors? No, the Supreme Court of Canada has said over and over again that Aboriginal peoples in Canada have never been conquered. They said that in the Haida Nation decision, they said that in the Manitoba Métis Federation decision, and they said that in the Karasakani and Rio Tinto decision. So it wasn't conquest. The other uh, option in uh, colonial international law is known as prescription, in other words, effective control. Did the Crown somehow get effective control over that territory, sufficient to be able to claim sovereignty to it before entering into Treaty 3? Absolutely not. The answer is no. And the reason why we know that is because the very reason the Crown wanted to enter into Treaty 3 was precisely because they didn't have control over the territory, but they needed to get control in order to build the railway to BC, which they had promised BC that they would do in order to get BC to enter into Confederation. They tried to build the railway without the treaty, and the First Nations stopped them, right? They wouldn't allow them to do it. That was the whole purpose of entering into Treaty 3, was to be able to get on the ground. Okay, so it wasn't through treaty, it wasn't through conquest, it wasn't through effective control. The only other option left, the only other explanation is the doctrine of discovery, right? Which we all know is the assumption that indigenous peoples, including their laws and land use, are inferior to Europeans and to European laws and European land use. In other words, indigenous land was seen as terra nullius, as being empty. 
And because of that, Europeans are entitled to simply claim sovereignty to it just by showing up and getting off the boat. Okay, so a number of principles from St. Catherine's Milling have been modified or overruled throughout the jurisprudence since the 1800s. But the aspect of St. Catherine's Milling that hasn't been overruled is precisely this, the doctrine of discovery. Now the Supreme Court of Canada, though, seems to be really uncomfortable with that. So in its most recent decision on Ab Aboriginal title, the Silco Teen decision, it makes this claim that the doctrine of discovery, bracket, that no one owned the land prior to European assertion of sovereignty, and bracket, never applied in Canada, as confirmed by the Royal Proclamation. Wow, if only saying it made it so, right? So as John Burroughs has said, Canadian law still has terra nullius written all over it. And we can see this in the actual substance of the Silco Team decision. So the court explains that the crown gets its underlying title to the land in all of BC at the time when it asserts sovereignty. Right? So by asserting sovereignty, it gets title. In other words, it doesn't get it through treaty. It doesn't get it through conquest. Right? There was no conquest. And it doesn't get through effective control, right? Because the assertion of sovereignty is interpreted not in terms of effective control vis-a-vis -vis First Nations and Indigenous peoples. That just leaves doctrine of discovery. So why does the Supreme Court say that terra nullius never applied here? What does that mean? What they really mean is that the doctrine of terra nullius in its strongest possible formu formulation doesn't apply. In the sense that when Europeans erased indigenous sovereignty just by getting off the boat. It wasn't that we as indigenous people were left with nothing at all. In exchange for the loss of sovereignty, we got Aboriginal rights. So Aboriginal rights are the leftovers from the doctrine of discovery. Right? They're the burden on the Crown's underlying title. So what this means is that even from the British and Canadian perspective, the treaties could not affect a surrender of sovereignty. Because from the British and Canadian perspective, when Europeans showed up, First Nations no longer had sovereignty, right? So a treaty surrendering sovereignty would have been superfluous. There would have been no point to it. There's nothing for them to surrender in the terms of sovereignty. All they had to surrender was this leftovers, right? Aboriginal rights. So why is it so important to understand that the doctrine of discovery is still operating in Canadian law? Well, there are a few reasons. The first is that when I teach this material, I often get the response from students that, well, these claims are based in ancient history, right? This is, this is old, this is in the past. What we need to do is just look forward and uh, move on. And a sentiment that's closely linked to that is the notion that, you know, we're complaining about things from the past and we can't judge the people of the past by today's standards, values, and norms that if we try to do that, then we're engaging in anachronistic reasoning, right? And that's an error in reasoning. The answer to both of these concerns is that the doctrine of discovery is not in the past. It's not ancient history. It's the explanation right now, today, for how Canada has sovereignty over this territory, right? And we are absolutely entitled to use today's values and today's norms to judge it. Now, the final reason why I think this is key is because the myth that First Nations surrender their sovereignty in treaties is a way of burying the truth that the real explanation for our country's claim to sovereignty is the doctrine of discovery. And as Senator Murray Sinclair has said, before we can have reconciliation, we must have truth. And the truth is that our country is built on this foundation of inequality. So the sooner we can acknowledge that and fix it, the sooner we can go forward in a good way. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen Miigwech. And now we'll ask Michael Coyle to share his remarks with us. Miigwech. Bonjour, Anin. Good evening. Um, I also would like to begin by thanking Rick, our knowledge keeper for the evening, and uh, the dancers, the singers rather, and uh, Vanessa for that very powerful um, performance. Um, I want to talk about, and I think this might flow nicely from what uh, Karen has just talked about, and Anne, 
about how treaties, or rather the principles that underlay the treaty making process in Canada, could actually be a positive technology for justice going forward. Now, my own perspective is as a law professor, like some other people around this, this table, but also as uh, Tom mentioned, and let me thank the university for inviting us here today as well, it's been a very exciting event. Uh, but also I've, I've been a mediator for a long time. For some 25 years I've been in the middle between First Nations and federal and provincial governments trying to help them move forward in treaty disputes. Uh, typically some of the worst where lands were promised under treaty and then just taken without even consulting the First Nation involved or flooded uh, or some other flagrant violation of the Crown's promises. So my experience is, is not just as a law professor, but also kind of pragmatic, and, and that might inform the way I speak to you today. I suppose lastly I should say that I'm not Indigenous. Um, so my perspective on the way forward is from the non-Indigenous side of the table. Um, I personally don't see a problem with that because the treaties are about bridges between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples, and if it's going to be a healthy partnership, it's going to be based on communication and respect from, from both sides. Um, so, um, what I want to suggest is that despite what uh, Karen has accurately described as the way the courts have acted as if uh, the British Crown and later the Canadian Crown always had jurisdiction and sovereignty even over Indigenous lands before they met the Indigenous people who lived on those lands, and that is the current uh, basis of the assertion of Canadian sovereignty in this country today. And even though Karen is right in saying that the courts have denied, or historically denied, that Indigenous peoples had any property rights or any real ability to consent to how their own lands would be used, and that's correct, the historic treaty process in Canada gives the lie to those two assumptions. Um, I'll get into this in a minute, but uh, you don't enter into a land-sharing treaty with the people to seek the, their consent to have access to their lands unless you must be assuming that they have rights to their lands and some say over what happens on their lands. You don't enter into a treaty with any group of people unless you think they will be able to be accountable for the commitments that are made and the relationship that is built in that treaty. And the only way a people can be accountable is if they have the ability, in this case, an inherent right or a recognized right, to govern themselves, to make decisions, to make commitments on behalf of their people. So we have this strange contradiction in Canadian history that uh, it, the courts have really paid very little attention to the fundamental principles of treaty making, of land sharing treaties, to the stories and the worldviews of indigenous peoples. Um, but the treaty making process itself seems to be based on very different and contradictory premises or assumptions. And that's what I'd, I'd like to talk to you about. I think everybody, well, I'll go very quickly through where we're at with, with treaties today. I, I suppose my starting point is, um, as far as the historic treaties in Canada, which started with the Treaty of Niagara in terms of uh, dealing with, with lands in, in this part of the world in 1764 and leading up to the Williams Treaty of 1923, um, those treaties uh, were the basis on which the Crown settled most of Canada and certainly most of Ontario and certainly this area, Mississauga and Anishinaabe land. Uh, near Lake Ontario. So those treaties were entered into. I want to come in a moment to the assumptions that underlay that process. But almost immediately after the first treaties were signed, Canada started acting unilaterally as if treaty, the treaty relationship didn't exist. So Aboriginal peoples are left out of confederation. They're there simply as a subject that somebody can make laws about rather than a partner in, in confederation reflecting their role as a partner in the, the settlement and the building of, of this country. 
Uh, the Indian Act is passed very quickly after Confederation. We saw the, the status card uh, in Vanessa's performance. And very quickly, Aboriginal and Indigenous conceptions of citizenship and membership in their society and responsibilities and identity are just discarded and turned into something that will be decided by a bureaucrat in Ottawa who has never met the people involved and has no understanding of the concepts of kinship or citizenship within those peoples. And then, of course, on the political side, you see um, non-Indigenous people and corporations stripping the land of resources. Um, and virtually no sharing of the benefit of that stripping of resources with Indigenous peoples. And virtually no participation in the forestry industries, the gold extraction, copper extraction, etc. Um, in fact, the last time I looked, there wasn't even a, a forestry company in, in Ontario that was controlled by Indigenous people. That might have changed since I looked. Similarly, there was no thought of partnership with the Indigenous peoples on the treaty territory in discussing the effects on the environment and obligations of stewardship toward the land. Uh, when this resource extraction was taking place. And we've heard in the news lately the story of grassy narrows where forestry led to mercury contamination um, that destroyed a community. We had to relocate. They were literally poisoned and still are being today. And notwithstanding that they had entered into a treaty talking about sharing the land, they weren't consulted over those decisions. We have seen a renewal of Canadian law since 1982 when the Constitution finally recognized treaty rights as part of the fundamental principles of Canadian law. But at the moment, when we talk about historical treaties, the courts have tended to look at them as if only one perspective matters, and that's a non-Indigenous Victorian lawyer's contract, uh, contract interpretation theory. So if the treaty says that X plows and so much twine and ammunition and one dollar per chief or per uh, member will be paid to the First Nation. Um, and in return, the First Nation will give the Crown absolute rights to do whatever it, it wants. If, if the written document says that, the courts have been generally applying that approach. Um, now they haven't, I've argued elsewhere, that they haven't really taken contract principles that fav would favor Indigenous peoples like the, the way they apply in non-Indigenous contexts, like fraud, misrepresentation, what kind of effects undue influence, what kind of effects those kind of principles have on the implementation of a treaty. So the basic, the basic approach of the court so far is to say what the treaty was was not the building of a relationship of respectful coexistence that was intended to benefit both peoples. It was instead a, an exchange, an exchange reflected in a, in a, a piece of paper and that piece of paper is what we'll still look at 150 years later as defining the obligations of both sides. And we, and you, we know the results of, of that, right? Um, we see poverty within First Nations because they have not been able to share in the resources. We see governance decisions, whether it's about child welfare or criminal justice, education, all being made from Ottawa or Toronto um, and not from uh, the First Nations. Uh, who are most directly involved. So how might we move forward? How much time do I have, Karen? Four minutes or something? Three. Three, okay. I'll just sketch out some ideas then. <laughs> Given that there are such different understandings of what was going on in the treaty-making process, and such different values, norms, worldviews, which we could see even today between, it's hard to imagine the people that we've heard from or watched perform today sitting down and drafting the kind of contract about, well, that the Williams Treaty, for example, reflects as intending to govern their lives going forward. Um, indigenous peoples were recognized as peoples who had their own norms, had created their own norms, and lived up to those norms, and had ways within their societies of ensuring social harmony in accordance with those norms. On the Crown side, we have, as, it, as Anne has mentioned, a much more legalistic approach to treaty making. So what do we do with this clash of, of views? Well, we know that people sat down together to try to build a technology, if you will, 
a framework for coexistence, a new framework that hadn't been tried anywhere else in the world, really, land-sharing agreements. And we know that they tried to create new norms in doing that. And I want to suggest, I think it's obvious, they're not those, they're not limited to what's written in the paper documents. So what might some of those norms be? Well, I think that the basic process of treaty making uh, leads inevitably to the conclusion that certain premises, certain assumptions must have been shared if the parties were being rational when they went into that process. One I've mentioned already, um, and that is, <coughs> If the treaties were not intended to be worthless from the beginning, um, then they were intended to encapsulate commitments from both sides. That implies that both sides of the negotiation table had the right to make decisions about their own affairs and to govern themselves in the future so as to act consistently with whatever agreement or relationship they established. So the right to govern on the indigenous side, indigenous peoples, uh, in terms of their own futures, is a necessary assumption and implication of the treaty-making process, particularly where it hasn't been expressly, or nobody's expressly tried to deny it, even in the written documents. A second <coughs> assumption, shared premise. Everybody shared the premise that the treaties were intended to guide the parties for a very long time. I was going to quote you some something from the treaty negotiations, but I'll skip that. But you've heard the language, as long as the rivers run and the sun shines. It's very explicit in the treaty negotiations. This is intended to cast our relationship, our, our, our relations together, essentially forever, is the language that's used. Well, if that is the case, and that, that was the understanding, as far as we can see, then an inevitable um, implication of that is that both parties would be prepared to discuss renewing their relationship, polishing the chain, when circumstances change as they inevitably would if we're going from the time of a treaty in 1830 to eternity. Everyone knows that the treaties were never intended to be a, a blueprint for land use for the next 500 years. So a necessary implication of the treaty making process is that both parties would sit down and talk about ensuring that the treaty still benefited both sides and were adequate to their needs as circumstances changed. We'll see, I see that my time is running out. I'll just mention one final um, principle, which I think also flows naturally from the foundational premises of the treaties, and that is that the treaties were intended to benefit both peoples. The Crown expressly stated this all of the time, uh, but even where they didn't state it, it's just nobody enters into a long-term ar ar arrangement without, without it, the intention that it will benefit them. Explicit promises were made that the treaties would benefit Indigenous peoples. Um, so, for me, an, an inevitable implication of that, one I think that the court should recognize, is that the treaties shall not be interpreted or implemented in a way that renders one party impoverished, but rather they must either negotiate new arrangements if there are, uh, is a proposed development on traditional treaty territory, there should be discussion, not merely as the Supreme Court of Canada has said so far about potential impacts to the Indigenous people, but also to a reasonable sharing of the benefits from the taking of resources or the, the management of those lands. So I've only had an opportunity to mention a few, but it seems to me that those kinds of principles logically should form the pillars, at least from a, a non-Indigenous kind of common law perspective, of this new institution, this new technology that was created called the Land Sharing Treaty. It should be built upon, of course, through dialogue from both sides, because I know that no Indigenous person I've ever spoken to has described treaties in quite a, quite a static a way as, as I just have. But there will be a need for an exchange to make sure that building on those pillars is done in a way that respects both parties, both treaty partners' worldviews and values. Miigwech. I'd like to thank Michael Miigwech and turn the mic over to the last of our panelists to share his initial comments, and of course that's Johnny Mack. Thanks, Natalie. Miigwech, uh, klako, klako, uh, to the Mississauga of Skugog Island, did I get that right? 
um, for tolerating my trespass here. <laughs> um, and by that I mean uh, to give full honor of their law, their legal authority, and uh, recognizing that uh, I haven't observed the protocols that would likely be required for me to dwell here. So I, uh, I acknowledge that and appreciate the toleration. Um, wow, that's loud. So I tried to extract this uh, argument out of a larger piece today, and I've been struggling with a headache and also recovering from a night out with Tom last night. Uh, <laughs> not at my sharpest today. Um, so f I'm, I'm going to kind of take refuge in the text, uh, and uh, forgive me if it doesn't hold together that well, but I, I think it should, it should make sense. So the conceptual backdrop to this pr presentation isn't breaking any new ground. Here, without getting into the nuances or caveats to the argument, I'll frame it around a few simplified propositions. The first claim is that citizenship is plural. Cit in, in citizens, we find the diverse set of allegiances and commitments to separate and distinct forms of authority. Perhaps we can think of these forms of authority as uh, the location of sovereignty with local, national, and or transnational dimensions, and which source their legitimacy in the distinct historical normative, in distinct historical normative locations. Further, these authorities come into being because citizens, because of citizens and the shared histories of belonging to one another and the normative commitments that inform their collective aspirations and give shape to the dynamic contours of collective ob obligation. This is the space where I think we turn to find law. The second proposition is to, is to say that a critical first step of the settler colonial project was to eliminate the multiplicity of sovereigns that preceded European arrival. The basic argument is that the very existence of the settler state demands the elimination of indigenous or competing legal authorities. The point here is that indigenous law supports indigenous people's territorial claims. Therefore, indigenous law would, it seems, preempt the settler state's claim to indigenous lands and authority over indigenous peoples. Absent agreement conquest, or conquest, state law would have no force or effect on indigenous peoples in their territories. The point here is that the strength of the settler state's sovereign assertions and the strength of indigenous law are inversely related. The expansion of one requires the retraction of another. Eliminating indigenous law, or at least thinning it out radically, is a jurispathic precondition to the entire settler colonial project. These points are relatively well made out in the field of settler colonial studies. We can turn to people like Patrick Wolfe or Glenn Colthard or Audra Simpson to, to track the arguments. And in Canada, as we all know, this has been achieved with reference to a terra nullius logic that presumed indigenous lands to be empty of an authority equivalent to those imagined in Europe. It is true that indigenous authority was acknowledged in the pre-settlement period of colonization. We see clear acknowledgement of this in the stories that we've heard earlier, embedded in the wampum belts and the two-row kind of model of shared authority. We see that in the early stages. But as the colonial project turned to settlement and the establishment of a robust Westphalian state, what we know today, these sovereigns became less tolerable. The move at this point was to topple these competing sovereigns and exhaustively vest all former de formal decision-making authority in the nation state. To a large extent, these indigenous sovereigns were quite effectively to toppled. What remained of them, what remains of them, is largely thinned out. The existence of these sovereigns continues to interrupt and burden Canadian authority, but they do not present a realistic or viable alternative to it for most indigenous communities. This is, this is my read. They have, <clears throat> and they haven't for some time. Indigenous peoples would be treated as subjects of the constitutional order in Canada, as matter, matter to be regulated rather than a partner authority within this constitutional imaginary. The point I want to emphasize is that in this period, in this period indigenous peoples were not citizens with access to the, to the set of democratic human rights and freedoms that we typically associate with citizenship in a liberal settler state. Here's my third proposition. While this, while this period effectively subordinated the formalized sites of indigenous sovereignty, 
the isolation and containment of indigenous peoples in this period actually served to sustain an, indige an indigenous civic imaginary practice. While indigenous institutions of government and social order were significantly diminished, the state's resort to violence and paternalism and forced isolation worked also to generate an imperative of indigenous survivance. Indigenous peoples would embed their long-standing forms of relationality on the reg registers of culture and everyday practice. So the paternalistic wardship model of Indian policy made its target indigenous governing structures as means of clearing the land of competing sovereign authority. But this policy did not do so well at addressing the authoritative source of those competing sovereigns, the shared normative commitments of the indigenous citizens and their commitments to recall the stories and histories that, rational <clears throat> that rationalized there what had become intolerable sovereignty. Without an institutional framework, this sovereignty would manifest in the field of everyday practices and social life. Absent formalized expression, institutional expression, this field would be characterized as, a cult as cultural rather than political or legal. Culture stripped of its political and legal dimensions would be reduced to a topic of consideration that would be firmly within the settler state's framework of sovereignty and regulation. My concern is that treaty draws us in our jurist generative imagination and practice, draws our civic commitments into the settler colonial framework of authority. I see this happening in the context of contemporary treaty negotiations. And here I'm thinking of negotiations in British Columbia, the BC Treaty Commission, and uh, I belong to one of the nations, or the extent to which I still belong is a little bit tenuous, but I come from one of the nations that have recently signed a treaty on, within the BC Treaty Commission framework. Only four nations, four, only four treaties have been signed, ratified, and I think only two at this point are in effect. And one of the approving groups is the Manuth, who voted to accept their final agreement in 2007, with an overwhelming, almost 70% majority. Three weeks after approving the final agreement act, the Liberal government of British Columbia hosted a celebration. In front of a crowd of roughly 200 Monoth delegates gathered in the rotunda at the provincial legislature, Premier, then Premier, Gordon Campbell, and Monoth chiefs all signed the agreement. This is a triumph for generations of Monoth leaders and people, Campbell said as he presented the Monoth, Monoth chiefs with a traditional New Chanoth canoe. Campbell had, Campbell had given the canoe a new Chanoth name, which he translated to the crowd as the one who calms down water. The atmosphere was electric. The Monuth delegate, delegates were screaming, hollering, they were beating their drums. It was a very exciting place. The ecstatic feeling would increase when Campbell paid tribute to phrases of importance to indigenous peoples. This is about self-determination, to set out the future you want and working together to build it. And I want to say congratulations to all of you for the strength of your vision when you voted to ratify this treaty. The chiefs of the five Monuth tribes then shook Camp Premier Campbell's hand. The eldest amongst those chiefs, the Toquat Tai Hatwa, Hatwea, the Toquat chief, and, and also my uncle Bert Mack, uh, stepped forward. And of course, he's got this elderly authorial presence. Everybody quiets down. He presented. Premier Campbell with a paddle, and he told them, and he sa said to him, you are now the captain of our canoe. Later that day, in a speech later that day, my Uncle Bert spoke of the Monuth Treaty, Monuth tribes as extreme underdogs in negotiation with the settler state, but against the odds, he concluded that we had won. The symbolism here suggests that the treaty is not a win for the Monuth. It does not represent liberation from colonial domination, but rather a joining up with colonial imperative and, and civic political imaginary. The Monmouth Treaty Agreement cements British Columbia's control of our nation, giving it full and clear title to 97% of the Monmouth people's ancestral homelands, while cloaking itself in the rhetoric of, of being a generous sovereign that is giving rights to the people. While the treaty recognizes Monmouth legislative authority, that authority operates concurrent with and subordinate to the federal and provincial heads of power. And so 
My concern is somebody who comes from this nation, and it's a general concern that I have about treaties. Do I, how much how much for time? Okay. Is that um, where previously we would have worked together very deliberately to keep our legal history, to keep those norms, to keep that those stories alive, and we would turn to them to generate a sense of obligation, and also that would provide the foundation that we would stand on to resist, to actually just be able to live, give life to our histories in very constrained, violent times where actually we, we don't have that freedom. But now that we've entered into this treaty, treaty agreement, it provides a platform for us to kind of channel what all of our energies, all of our leaders now are thinking about law through this agreement. It's very detailed, there is 276 pages, there's uh, an appendix that's 400 pages that lays out comprehensively all of our rights. We have, as I mentioned, we have authority to make law now, but when we think about how we make law, our jurisgenerative kind of imaginations are channeled through this agreement, which again, is very constraining. You read this agreement, it's not freedom, it is, I think it's pretty hard to deny that it's uh, not, a, that it, is an assimilation. So, um, so, and that's my worry. Uh, there's a, also within the agreement process, there is a way that it doesn't allow for or tolerate dissent. If you stand outside it and try, want to challenge, or if you challenge the authority uh, of your negotiators or even of Canada to negotiate this agreement, uh, then you're left out of the process. They come through and uh, actually solicit your consent, every member has to sign something saying that they endorse their, their leadership to negotiate on their behalf. And uh, if you're not convinced that anything good can come out of those agreements, if you see it as thoroughly embedded in this kind of settler colonial logic and framework and institution of law that's premised on our disappearance and erasure, uh, then, and you refuse to sign, that means you don't even get a chance to vote at the end of the day. And then when the new nation is created under the treaty, the penalty for not signing on is that you don't even have a band to belong to anymore. Right? That nation, the, the Indian Act band dissolves, the new nation is created under the treaty, and you are not a member because you didn't, you didn't sign on in that, or at, that earlier, at that earlier stage. And so when I say, well, I, I'm Monmouth, I, I still feel like I belong to that territory, and I'm trying to keep up a sense of uh, what those commitments mean by referencing my own stories. I still activate my kinship connections. My, the, the current chief is my cousin. I still talk to them on the, the registers of kinship, and I'm still involved in ways like I still care about them, and I'm one of the most educated people in my community, so I have expertise to offer. But uh, I'm not a member. I'm not enrolled. I don't vote. Um, and so there is a way where I feel in, uh, in a very tangible way that uh, this treaty has uh, disenfranchised me not from the Canadian institutional framework but from my own tradition. And the more that my people continue to kind of organize themselves under and within the terms of the agreement, the less space there is for me to exist as an Indian. So, there's a lot of work happening through this agreement that, uh, I mean, it, it's through it we become Canadian citizens. It Canadianizes us, right? Um, and in doing so, clears the way. There, there's a kind of completion of the colonial project. They've taken, they, they've taken sovereignty off the table at an early stage, and they've captured our civic imagination that would otherwise give life to an alternative, different system. Uh, they have captured that through this contemporary treaty. And, Sorry, it's not an uplifting story, but uh, that's, thanks. Before I invite members of the panel who want to immediately respond to one another in brief, uh, and then move to questions from all the rest of us. I think maybe just one more time, we would like to thank our panelists for the privilege that we have all just enjoyed of hearing these perspectives. Michael. Well, I have a question for Johnny. Um, is that approach to leadership where one must 
give somebody what sounds like a blank check to make decisions on one's behalf and then let them go do it. Is that part of the traditional law of your people or the traditional norms of your people? Is it a traditional approach to leadership or is it coming from somewhere else? Uh, the, found, the, the concern on the, I mean, on government side, so the provinces, they want to know that the people who they're negotiating have the authority to actually sign an agreement. And of course, Indian Act bans are uh, crea the creation of a federal statute, right? They're not, that's not, the, you can challenge the legitimacy of that as a body to, uh, to negotiate with. So they want to make sure that who they're talking to is an, uh, is endorsed by the people, and so this is a kind of a pre a way of demonstrating that uh, the Ab the Manuth negotiators actually have the the democratic authority to engage. They're, but also, they're not agreeing to the agreement itself. They're simply saying, "You have uh, my authority. You have I recognize your authority to negotiate on my behalf, and you will later be able to vote on the agreement itself." But if you don't sign on at that earlier stage, if you say, no, I don't think, I think this is, uh, not, nothing good is going to come out of this. This whole process, treaty making process is kind of by design meant to, uh, to fold us into a, a legal structure that's not our own, right? Like if, if, you, if you have that colonial critique, you don't sign on, you don't even get to vote at the end of the day. You're just excluded from it. And so there is a way, I mean, there's some open questions. All, I mean, for every, for every mono citizen, all of their aboriginal rights, anything that they, any claim that they can bring against the state is uh, defined within the strict terms of the agreement. So any aboriginal rights claims you have, they say instead of anything that's outside of the treaty, instead of using the language of extinguishment, which we know from the older treaties, within the contemporary treaties, they use the language of certainty and containment. So. Uh, all of your agree any uh, claim, any Aboriginal right that you have is defined within the terms of the agreement. Anything that's outside of it, you, maybe you have it, but you, it, you can't use it to ground a legal claim. So there's a way where I might still hold those Aboriginal rights outside of that context, but the court has been quite clear that Aboriginal rights are collective rights. They don't vest in individuals, so I'm, it's, uh, I'm not very hopeful of that those Aboriginal rights have come to, to much meaning in my, in my case. And it's not just me, there's a handful of others. Uh, I think there's about 10 people who, most of whom they just couldn't find to get to sign the document. Um, but yeah, but I'll leave it at that, I'm talking too much. Any other panelists who would like immediately to share their thoughts on one another's presentations or would you like to let things unfold through the audience's questions? Unfold. Okay. All right. I'd like to invite uh, any audience members who have questions to sort of gather their thoughts. And I'm happy to take questions. I'm just, oh, okay. We do have a couple of microphones. So if you raise a hand so all of us can hear and we'll be able to record it for the, uh, the record of this event, you can uh, take advantage of the microphones if you're comfortable with that. Just as we're, as we're giving people a couple of minutes to let this sink in, uh, I think I'd like to, to comment on one of the, the shared themes, but particularly it, it, it's a riff off of the exchange between Michael and Johnny a moment ago. Part of what we've been talking about uh, is treaties as looking at treaties from two extreme perspectives. And one of them, the one that we've just heard about uh, very powerfully, is understanding treaties as a kind of completion of the colonial project. And one of the, one of the things that I, I happen to observe, have observed is that the experience that Johnny's describing of every individual member of a band being asked to uh, accede to participation in a certain logic of colonialism through a, a participation in a certain legal construction of what future relationships might look like, that's something that's actually a reaction to a past omission of the BC Treaty Commission process, as far as I'm aware, and, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, there have been a series of cases that have not necessarily reached national attention uh, over the past decade and a half in which members of different First Nations that are officially involved in the BC Treaty process today 
Members of those First Nations have contested the authority of the particular negotiators who, have, who are understood by the government to be speaking on their behalf. And this has led to, for example, in the Spoke case uh, that involves several different Gitsan communities, individuals who did not sign a paper have tried to uh, uh, take the British Columbia government and the BCTC Commission itself to court saying that the proceedings are illegitimate, the treaty negotiations don't have any, shouldn't have any force because the negotiators who speak for them don't in fact represent them. And so I think the practice, as far as I'm aware now, of asking individual band members to accede to representation by particular <coughs> negotiators is a, is a relatively new development in the last, I think, 10 to 15 years, meant to try to uh, stop a, or fill a hole in the, the, the sort of legal logic of treaty making to prevent a certain kind of objection from being raised. And so there's being trapped through uh, involuntary inclusion, and then there's being trapped through involuntary exclusion. And both of those are results of the same logic as far as I can see. So I've, a, I've made a comment with a kind of questioning tail to it. If any of our panelists would like to uh, respond to that, I'd be very interested, but I'm also interested in hearing what our audience members think. This really is meant to be a conversation, and because people have been so specific and powerful in their comments, I know that it's very difficult to feel able to respond in an authoritative way, but it's a conversation. That's where these things always start. I see a hand in the back. Hello. Um, hi, Lawrence. Hi. My name, is, <coughs> excuse me. My, my name is Lawrence. I'm a fourth year criminology legal studies student here at UIT. First off, I'd just like to thank all of you guys for participating in today's uh, conference panel. Um, I found it very informative of all of the opinions and perspectives that you guys brought forth today. Um, my question bases around the notion of treaties and what you guys see as the most effective manner in which to seek justice and proper understanding within the criminal, ju criminal justice system but also within society. So to put simply, do you view the treaty, like the resolution or the fixing of the past treaties as the most appropriate method to achieve your end goal, or do you view an alternative method or something more modern as the most effective method to get your message across to the current generation of 2018 and for the future generations? Anybody want to tackle that? Maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, I think I think that the treaties are um, an important part of the, of the way forward, or at least rethinking what the treaties meant is an important part of the way forward. Um, in part because the original treaties, a, a key theme of those treaties, a universal theme, was kinship, that what the parties were doing was developing new relationships of, of respect and care and um, uh, duty to each other. So. The Crown was always emphasizing this. The Crown negotiator was always saying, you know, sometimes they would use like patriarchal terms like you are our children, at least from, from their point of view, but we will be establishing a family-like relationship. And on the indigenous side, we, we see that too. The dotums that appear on very many of the treaties, the symbols of the clans of the people who signed them, can be interpreted as an explicit invitation to join into kinship relationships with the clans and, and with the, the people on the indigenous side of, of, of the treaty. So if, 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 if a focus of treaties is relationship, and I think that's helpful, then the parties, the part, treaty partners, can talk about, okay, well, how should that move forward? And presumably, we don't think of good relationships in terms of containment. My relationship with my mother is one of containment, or I can't remember the other word you used, Johnny. But uh, that, that seems to me to be the opposite of the spirit of the original treaties. So thinking about who should be making decisions about the um, right way to treat people who have disturbed the social order or harmony in a, let's say, on a reserve or in a Métis community, 
um, I think that's a worthwhile exercise. And it seems to me that it, it would make a lot of sense to allow the people who are living there and are most affected by it to uh, govern themselves in accordance with their own norms, their own spirituality, their own uh, principles. I, I just can't see as a non-Indigenous person why I would want to suggest that I know better. In fact, the way our criminal justice system and the rates of incarceration of Indigenous people have come, come to be in Canada shows that the non-Indigenous side doesn't know better. So I think thinking about treaties as, the, as incorporating a need to have ongoing relationships and relationships that will have to be flexible to some extent as they move forward uh, is one useful technology for trying to heal the relationship. Um, I mean, I don't dismiss treaties outright. I mean, I think it, it presents to indigenous peoples as they're currently organized a field uh, through which they can actually speak to Canadian power, right? And so it is, a, it, is, it is a space where we can have a hand in defining the rights that the Crown is going to be willing to rec recognize. But I think we need to be very careful not to presume that there's anything anti-colonial happening there. We're talking about an engagement with a bureaucratic state, so the, I, think, I think we know full well when we're negotiating with, with, with uh, federal government, provincial government negotiators, we know that they're not our kin. All you have to do is sit in these rooms for five minutes to realize that. You're doing something else, right? Something else is happening, and uh, I don't think that we should dismiss uh, the gains that can be made there, uh, but also it, it's, it's all happening within the context of crown sovereignty. That's not up for negotiation. Now you can kind of humanize or soften the kind of ongoing colonial machine it, as it comes to you through its institutions. You can maybe humanize the criminal justice system a little bit, but I think we need to recognize from an indigenous perspective that this is one of the key ways that settler colonialism actually takes people, I mean, they used to keep us on reserves and require us to have passes to get out. Mm -hmm. and now they take our kids and throw them into the, in, within the social welfare system. We lose our kids that way. We lose a lot of our, uh, I mean, my mom was in jail for a lot of my growing up. She was locked up. I lost my mother because of the criminal justice system. Um, this is another way of, uh, another institution through which settler colonialism imposes itself in the everyday. So not through the Indian Act and those uh, the, the draconian provisions of the Indian Act that were revi revised in 1951, but now through um, criminal legislation and applying to us as Canadian citizens. I think it's still, it's carrying out a lot of that work. Karen, may I add something to that? Um, so I've written a lot about imbalances of power and I've seen them at the negotiation table and so I know what Johnny is talking about. Um, one way of helping to address that imbalance of power that occurs in negotiations between a state and, and a, an indigenous community or a group of indigenous communities, I think is and I know this is an imperfect institution, but if, for example, the courts would recognize that the kinds of principles that we've been talking about and that I was talking about, self-determination, sovereignty, um, right to some fair sharing of benefits from the land, et cetera, if they would recognize that those are non-displaceable principles of the relationship. Common law courts do that in other cases, like a, they've recognized that a partnership can exist or marriage historically before statutes. Uh, uh, approved of, of, of them. And that there are certain principles that the parties to a partnership just have to recognize. Everybody's jointly and separately liable. It doesn't really matter what one party tries to twist the other's arm to uh, agree to. If they actually become partners, these are going to be the rules. And so I don't know to what extent it's feasible that a court would ever adopt fundamental principles that could not be displaced by looking at the treaty text or displaced by government negotiators in a, at around a negotiation table, but I think it's, it's one way of trying to help rebalance that power. And if the court actually said that from kinship we get to sharing of benefits and the things that are equivalent to caring, I, I think that, that would be a positive step. I think we have a question from the other side of the room. Is this working? I don't know. Oh, it is working. Uh, my name is Mohammed Hamid, and my question is, I have two questions actually. Uh, my first question is, is for Michael, and it's wondering, 
around the, the notions of the land sharing agreement as making assumptions about the intent of the folks who are engaging in that conversation. So I'm wondering about the position of the indigenous peoples as they moved into the land sharing conversations, if they were positioned in a space, and this is my wondering, I don't know this, where they were at a reasonable, given all of the limitations and restrictions and all of the pieces that have happened up to that point, if they were truly uh, 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 in, a, in, a, in a space, fair space, to be able to engage in those conversations at a place where um, you know, there was all these um, barriers and limitations and all of these structures that were limiting their true engagement in that agreement is my first wondering. My second wondering speaks to, and Johnny talked about this in the second part of when we were just talking there, is if, you know, it, it, why is it, and this is a wondering again, if we're thinking about the move forward, we're still talking about the notion of, of courts granting this and, and, and allowing this and still thinking about the structures of, you know, um, settler colonialism that people have to now work within. You know, is there a notion of trying to remove those hierarchical structures or the, the structures of seeking um, approval to be able to have natural conversation, is that even something that is within the scope of moving forward or not? So, sort of complex. So I just had that second question, what kind of hierarchical structures are you referring to? Any, courts, for example. Oh. Uh, you know, hierarchy in general. Right. Uh, you know, all of those notions. I mean, is, is, there, is there really a space where we can enter into you know, and Johnny was talking about the experience in BC, and again, it's all of these experiences of having to work within these 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 these, these oppressive structures. Yeah. Um, so, just thank you. No, those are, I'm glad that you raised both of those questions. I'd like to hear from our colleagues up here afterwards as well. But um, so you you raised some fundamental questions. Uh, I'll start with the second one, you know, is, is it possible that justice can arrive through the courts? Courts being a set of institutions created by one side of the treaty in accordance with the norms of, of that side of the treaty. And um, unfortunately, the way they're set up in the, in the context of treaties, those courts tend to be criminal courts most of the time. Somebody's being prosecuted for catching bullfrogs or buying six, selling six salmon or, or whatever it is. So the, the forum is a particularly disrespectful one. If we're, it's not between peoples, it's not between nations, it's we're gonna target members of your community who think that they're living up to their treaty rights and we'll have a judge decide in the context of a criminal proceeding. So there's lots of important questions about forum. And I, I know there are many people that I respect who think it's pointless to ask for recognition of indigenous laws or treaties in um, a non-indigenous forum. Because even if they're in good faith, they won't get it. They, the, our, our laws would be distorted if, if um, that is indigenous laws would be distorted even if a, a superior court were to try to respectfully uh, implement them in an appropriate case. Um, so there are some who think that from my own work, communities often have no choice but to make arguments in the courts, right? Somebody has been arrested or at the moment the Robinson, uh, Huron and Robinson Superior peoples are arguing for a change to the annuities that they received. Sometimes the chief and the community know that to get something done to stop a development in their, in their treaty territory or at least to try to secure fair environmental terms, if, it is gonna, if the project is going to proceed, they have to go to the courts. So it's, it's, I don't deny all of the, um, the power structures are, are tilted typically against indigenous peoples, the normative structure uh, is, is tilted, uh, but I think there is still help that can come from that area. Now that, that's just me speaking. but. Um, uh, there are principles, Karen kind of described how the Supreme Court of Canada doesn't want to admit that this is a country that's based on assuming that nobody was here and, you know, when, when Europeans arrived. Um, but you can tell the court's pretty uncomfortable with that and they are trying to improve. It may take a long time. But, so I, I suppose my final answer on that part of the question would be, they are there in some First Nations and, and Métis and Inuit peoples 
will need their protection from time or will want to use that forum. And if that's the case, it's best that the principles being applied by the courts are the fairest that we can all make them as lawyers, politicians, and, and, and citizens. Your first question is an even more challenging one, and I, I took your question to be, is it possible that many of the Indigenous Treaty partners really weren't in a position to defend their interests fully at the time of the treaty? Is that, did I understand that correctly? And there's no doubt about that. I was once up in, um, in Thunder Bay at a meeting of NAN chiefs, Anishinaabe Aski Nation chiefs, and they're very angry because they don't believe they really had an opportunity to negotiate uh, the terms of the written document. And that raises a difficult question because um, there's no doubt that's true. And, and it is also true that where, there, where they may have been able to negotiate a treaty that, or a relationship or a treaty that seemed fair, um, many of the terms that they agreed on aren't going to be recorded in the Crown's reports. Um, there have been several court cases that have already found that to be the case, but now we're in a realm of history where we don't have the elders anymore who can testify about what was said. So I'm a, there are two options there, I suppose. One is to say this treaty is a nothing because it was the result of coercion, duress, which is a principle that's recognized in, in law, or, um, and, and therefore the party should start again, right? That, the land still belonged, the Aboriginal title would still be with, with the Indigenous peoples, presumably, um, and the parties would have to renegotiate. That's one option. Many, many chiefs that I know don't want to renounce the treaties because they do see it as a fundamental recognition of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship with, with the Queen, with, with the state, and of their inherent rights. But that's one option to try to argue that in an extreme case like what you've talked about, that um, there never really was what we call in contract law consensus ad item. There never really was an understanding, or at least an uncoerced understanding. Um, the other option, I, and this is, I think what I'm trying to modestly suggest, is that the kinds of principles that, that I was discussing, and I've written about them in more detail in a, in a, in a book, um, they seem to me to be at least the beginnings of a, a more healthy and respectful relationship going forward. And um, because we often don't have the historical evidence as to what happened in a particular date, the last big treaty case at the Supreme Court of Canada, Treaty 3, didn't bring forward and never <coughs> to talk about what the understandings were on their side of Treaty 3 and forestry, etc. cetera. Um, we may have to rely on what we can both agree on both sides of um, the bridge, what we can both agree are, are um, fair principles for moving forward. Anyway, I'll, I've been talking too much. I'd like to invite any of our other panelists who might like to speak to the question that was just uh, handed off. I think Anne has something to well. add. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if we had the chance to do those treaties again, do you honestly think that we'd sign them? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, knowing what we know now, knowing what was left out, um, I can only speak to the Williams Treaty, and I can't even say much about that because it is in the courts. But I do know this, that many, many people think that we were uneducated, that we didn't speak English, that we weren't able to speak for ourselves. The Williams Treaty was signed in 1923. That was a few years after uh, World War I. In my community, our people believed so strongly in those treaties that we had 100% participation of eligible men sign up for World War I. That's how strong we felt those treaties. That's really saying something. I don't know too many communities that had 100% participation. When those men went overseas, they had a whole new education. They were shown a whole new way of living. They saw people that were living in decent houses, that people that had decent clothes, decent food, a decent education, everything that was lacking in our communities. Those men brought that knowledge back, but very few of those men are represented in those treaties. 
because those men were seen as a threat to the government and many of them were arrested. Many of them had to go underground, um, but they did have education. We did know. As for the voices of our elders, we have many, many audio tapes, interviews of elders that were born pre-1900, that were there present at the signing of that treaty, women and men, and every one of them has stated emphatically that what was brought back to our community was not what they had signed, not in the least. When you look at a First Nation and you talk about justice, you have to keep in mind that everything that we have done to survive has had to be outside of the law. It was illegal for us not to send our kids to residential school under penalty of going to jail or fined. It was illegal for us to leave the reserve without permission, so we had to sneak out. It was illegal for us to hunt and fish and trap, so we had to do that on the sly. Everything we have had to do to survive since settlement has been outside the law. So now we find ourselves in a position where we have huge populations in, incarcerated in this country. How can that not be so? Because, you know, the way w that we have been forced to live our lives has been directly against the law. Everything we've done. So when you're talking about treaties and you want to try and settle those treaties, there's a whole lot of history there that we have to take a look at. We'll never get what we deserve for the Williams Treaty because many of you have cottages up in Gravenhurst and you know Blue Mountain, all those beautiful, beautiful cottages. We thought that land was beautiful too. That's where we had our camps. That's where we buried our dead. That's where we visited every year to celebrate the lives of those dead. That's where we taught our history to our children, those pathways, those um, sites where we camped. That's our living history on the land. But we don't have access to that anymore because it's now cottage country. Um, if we got a settlement that spoke to the even the current um, cost of land in those areas, the government would go broke. So what are we going to do? We would like to have more land. Um, right now the process is incredibly slow. My own community, we have bought land uh, adjacent to our reserve. Um, the one piece of land, it's going on 15 years now that we're waiting to be able to use that land. But because of a process that isn't ours, we have to wait. Um, there's a whole lot of history there that, um, from our people, from First Nations people, that needs to be brought forward, that needs to be understood. And uh, part of my job as an archivist is I go into schools and I talk to kids about that. And I recently spent some time in a very um, privileged school. Um, Lakefield College School. Uh, very, very wealthy kids. I did something called a blanket exercise there where I was trying to show them a little bit of our history. And just by the responses I got from some of the students, um, all I could do was laugh. Really, all I could do was laugh because uh, some of them were so, um, if not racist, they were ridiculous. Um, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, especially when it comes to treaties. We're both going to need to be at that table. We're going to have to understand each other's history. We've had a few hundred years to learn your education system. We know your language. We know your religions. We know your laws. Uh, we know everything about you. We know everything about you. We don't need to know any more about you. But how many of you can say that you know the same amount about any First Nation. How many of you in this room can say that? Not many. I'll wager not any besides First Nations people. So when you think of that, you know, few hundred years that we've had to endure, and that's what it was, it was enduring and it was surviving this onslaught. 
when you think of that, when you think of the knowledge that we have that everybody ridiculed up until current times, um, it's a big, big, huge job ahead of us. And I'm not confident that the government we have in power right now is going to be able to carry through with, um, with the promises, um, with understanding, uh, with even sitting down and talking to us one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it was a big deal that um, Prime Minister Trudeau went to, uh, went to sit with those uh, youth in uh, Pekanjikum. That was huge. That's the first time ever. I would love to see each politician have to spend, I don't know, maybe a year in some place like Pekanjikum. Take their kids and their wives. Make their kids go to those schools where there's no heat where there is no gymnasium, where there is no science lab, where there's no library, where the food is ridiculously overpriced. I would love to see any politician take that upon themselves. The closest we've got is um, the mayor of Toronto. He went up to KI and um, he spent some time there. But other than that, I don't see any politicians going to any of those fly-in communities, those communities where suicide is a, a norm. It's a norm in so many of those remote communities. We have a ton of stuff to get over before we even start talking about the treaty process. Um, we have voices. We have the voices of our elders. We have the stories. It's time to recognize that and acknowledge that the stories that we carry that have been passed down from generation to generation to generation, those are viable stories. There is truth in them. There is truth in them. Just because it isn't written down on paper does not make it untrue. You have to get away from that colonial view and you have to be able to see the world through our eyes at least a little bit in order to understand where we're coming from. I don't mean to, you know, be a Debbie Downer or anything, but man, oh man, we've got a lot that we have to get over. And um, I really appreciate this forum that, uh, you know, because a lot of you are, are so intelligent and you have a say in what happens in this country, in this province. So I urge you to use your voice and stand with us and acknowledge what we need. Acknowledge our stories, acknowledge our elders, acknowledge the land and the water. Be respectful, respect one another, respect us, respect the land, respect all of those life that's on that land. Respect it, honor it. Every day when you get up, honor it. Give thanks for being able to breathe, for clean water, for a warm house, for clothes, for good food, be respectful, honor that. That's your job, that's what your job is in terms of that treaty. We have to do that. We do it willingly because it's a part of who we are. That land is in our blood and our blood is in that land. And so you have to do the same thing. You have to acknowledge that, you have to. That land is crying out, the treaties are crying out. Um, again, I'm getting off topic but I get going on land and, and things like that, and it it uh, it really it's it's emotional. It's um, something that we really really need to take a look at. So when you're talking about treaties and you're learning in your classes and you're teaching those students, keep all of that in mind. Tell them that they need to honor and respect. Tell them to go to the people and talk to the people. Tell them that there's more knowledge in those elders that are in our communities than they'll ever find in any library anywhere in the world. Those elders are our libraries. They hold our knowledge. They have that knowledge. Tell your students to go and speak to them. Yeah, it's going to be scary and you're not always going to find someone who's willing to share that knowledge because a lot of us, honestly, don't think you deserve it. But then there's this other voice that says, you know, you're exactly the ones that need those teachings. You're exactly the ones that have to listen. So keep that in mind when you're teaching your students. When you're going home tonight, keep that in mind. Share it with your family, share it with your, your children, your grandchildren, your sisters, your brothers, your aunties, your uncles, anybody who will listen. Talk to them about it, get their views. 
And for goodness sakes, talk to people on reserves. We're not that scary. Really, we're not. Don't listen to John Wayne. He didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> we're pretty good people. Thank you, Ryan. run out of time for that conversation that I invited you to join into. So on everyone's behalf, before I turn the proceedings back over to our chief organizer, Tom McMorrow, I'd like to thank our panelists and our audience for sharing their difficult and challenging and painful perspectives on the question of whether treaties can be a technology of justice. And I invite you to follow up with them in the reception that will follow this panel to thank them and also to thank our chief organizer, Tom McMorrow, who first conceived of this panel. I would like to echo Natalie's thanks. That uh, is a moving and thought-provoking and action demanding uh, set of uh, addresses that we received. I want to think, think of no more fitting way than, than uh, Anne's words um, to make us energized and to uh, give us something to talk about as we now conclude this chapter of the evening. And we have a, a wonderful reception um, that the good people at Berry Hill, the restaurant here in Oshawa, um, not that we aren't paying for it, but they 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 generously you know bring it and um, and I want to thank the people who have who have brought uh, our panelists' voices to you through this wonderful sound work and and the videography uh, our security staff the security staff here at the McLaughlin Gallery and uh, and Cheryl Ann uh, who's been our our liaison here at the McLaughlin Gallery and I want to thank all of you because the night's just getting started and uh, there's um, complimentary uh, non-alcoholic beverages. There's a cash bar and there's food because I know people are probably hungry. It's been a, it's been a big day and um, so I hope that you continue to, 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 that you begin nourishing your bodies and that you continue to nourish your minds throughout the evening. Thank you.